Levar os portugueses mais longe. Ser uma ponte entre Portugal e os Estados Unidos da América. Esta é a missão da Fundação Luz Americana para o Desenvolvimento. A FLAD nasceu em 1985, na sequência do Acordo das Lages, e por aqui passaram até hoje milhares de pessoas e ideias que ajudámos a transformar em realidade. Promovemos a partilha de conhecimento e experiências através de bolsas de estudo, estágios, prémios e conferências, unindo os dois lados do Atlântico. Trabalhamos diretamente com a comunidade portuguesa nos Estados Unidos. Queremos contribuir para que o papel dos luso-americanos seja cada vez mais forte e para que as origens portuguesas sejam continuamente celebradas. Nesta ligação atlântica surgem, claro, os Açores. Pela sua importância geoestratégica de segurança e defesa, científica e cultural, são um ponto essencial na atividade da FLAD. Somos ciência, educação, arte e relações transatlânticas. Há 36 anos a contribuir para o desenvolvimento de Portugal e dos portugueses. Hi everyone, um, welcome to our presentation. I am so glad to uh, be hosting this with my wonderful panel members. My name is Anna Ferreira. I am a PALCAS board member. And if you are watching this and you find this valuable, please consider joining PALCAS. You can find more information on PALCAS at www.palcas.org. So we're gonna start with brief introductions from our panel um, members. And we can go in the order that we're listed here. Everyone can see my screen. So um, welcome everyone. And we can go ahead and start with you, Tyler. Morning. Um, I'm sorry, sorry to hop in just a little bit late. It's uh, still fairly early, it's still 9 a.m. and I had some meetings earlier. Um, did you want me to introduce myself or what, what are we hopping yeah. into? That's cool. perfect, yeah, just, just introduction right. people, first one to go. Yeah, well, I'm Tyler Dos Santos Tam. I am the Honorary Consul of Portugal in Hawaii, and I'm also the President of the Portuguese Chamber of Commerce uh, of Hawaii. Hawaii is an interesting place uh, for the Portuguese in America. Um, you know, ha having arrived here as immigrants from 1878 to 1913, so now we're kind of in the third and fourth and fifth generation of Portuguese Americans. Um, and so this question of new communities is a really interesting one for us because we have a very old community and people are re-engaging um, third, three, four, five generations down the line. And also um, some new arrivals um, who of course want to come to the islands and we want to include them as well. So we can talk about that a little later. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Connie? Good, uh, I was gonna say good morning or good afternoon. It depends on where we are. I And I'm sorry, I had a little bit of technical difficulties. So, my fancy computer isn't working, so I hope you can see me from my phone. Um, you look great. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm Connie Almeida, and um, I came over here as an immigrant in 1967, actually moved to Connecticut, where there was a very thriving um, community. You know, we had a Portuguese church, Portuguese festas, Portuguese bakeries, Portuguese stores. In about 30... Three years ago, I moved to Texas, no Portuguese. Um, I, I actually live in Fort Bend County, which is outside of Houston, but the greater Houston area. And it was only about 25 years ago that, you know, just by coincidence, we met um, a couple other Portuguese families. And, um, and that really has been the start of it. You know, how do we develop a Portuguese community in a very large and diverse um, urban setting. So that's, um, you know, and I'm a psychologist by training. So I actually work with courts and justice systems. So thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Yes, um, I'm Lucy Brazil Wilkes. I'm a, a immigrant from the Azor Islands from the island of Chiseda. I came here when I was seven years old, back in 1968. Um, my father um, is from Saint George. My mother is from Chiseda, and um, he immigrated with five children and 
uh, a pregnant wife. So um, that took a lot of courage on, on his behalf. Uh, we originally settled in um, Northern California in Petaluma. And um, then we went to Southern California to Chino. And um, then we ended up in the San Joaquin Valley where my dad had an opportunity to start his own dairy. And we were there for several years that I uh, went to high school there. Um, in 1978, my father visited Idaho and the dairy opportunities in Idaho were much better than they were in California at that time. Um, still are, I think, but um, at any rate, uh, he came here and in 1984, uh, they started the first, my dad was one of the founders of the first Portuguese Festa here. And at that time, there were probably a hundred families uh, here be between the time my dad came in 78 and 1984 when the first uh, Festa uh, um, started up. So um, we have quite a Quite a large population, uh, I think. Um, last year at the, or the year before COVID at the Portuguese Festa, they fed about 600 people. Uh, not all of them were Portuguese, but they were connected to the Portuguese um, community or culture in, in some manner. So I am currently an uh, elementary school counselor. Um, I have, um, I, went to Boise State University and got my bachelor's degree, got my master's at uh, Northwest uh, Nazarene University, both here in, in Idaho. And um, I have all but a, a dissertation um, in, uh, from Walden University. So that's typically, uh, I am um, in my immediate family, I'm the only one with with a college degree. All of my um, siblings are younger than I am. Thank you, thank you, Lucy. Thanks. And Gonzalo. Hello everyone, my name is Gonzalo Souza. I am also an immigrant from Porto in Portugal. I moved to the United States six years ago. So uh, for, in my personal case, I bring a different perspective to this title. My, instead of perspective of new communities, I think I'm the new perspective on the communities uh coming coming from from portugal uh, so recently i'm currently studying at the university of california in santa barbara uh, where i'm double majoring with economics and accounting and portuguese which through that degree and uh, through that undergrad program i came in contact with the portuguese community here in california that being from portugal i had no idea that existed uh, so i only after coming here did i see and experience such a vibrant community uh, and I'm quite excited to, to be able to continue not only my studies, but start here with this conversation, how we can build these communities uh, and continue, let them and allow for them to continue to exist uh, with such power as they have in the past two centuries. Wonderful. Thank you. And last but not least, Boy. Oh, good afternoon. Uh, so uh, we all kind of share about about the same the same story about how we, we made it to the to United States, and uh, Gonzalo, we are almost uh, neighbors. I'm from Ispazin, so uh, that's what that's where I grew up before I came to the United States. Um, so I, I live in uh, so I, I when my parents moved to uh, to the United States, they first came to uh, to uh, uh, Massachusetts. So I grew up in Cambridge, Mass. Went to school in Cambridge, and uh, and then uh, doing uh, through my business through my work. I met my uh, my future wife uh, on a business trip, and she was from Arizona. And the one thing led to another, and here I am in Arizona today. Today, uh, I live in a town called Wickenburg, Arizona, where I am the uh, mayor of Wickenburg. I was uh, elected mayor about three years ago, and uh, and I'm also the honorary council for Portugal for Arizona. So so I, I play a number of roles, and uh, and I've lived here about 20, 25 years or twenty six years now, and. Uh, and the, the growing community here in, in Arizona started by by accident as well, not not by accident, but uh, was uh, we had a uh, the Scottsdale Center for the Performing Arts here brought uh, Anna Mora to do a concert 
here at, uh, in Scottsdale. And uh, one thing led to another. We all uh, we met a bunch of Portuguese people at the concert. And uh, all of a sudden, we all started getting together and it became a small group. And today, uh, today in our Portuguese uh, in Arizona face Facebook group, we have nearly 300, uh, 300 Portuguese that are uh, subscribed to the group. And the number continues to grow. Uh, now that I'm honorary counsel here in Arizona, uh, the number continues to grow because I get calls almost daily from people asking how to do all sorts of different things, uh, including renewing passports, renewing cartons, renewing all sorts of different things. So, so that community is growing and, and, it's, uh, and it's, uh, uh, it's great. Uh, we haven't held a fasta yet. Uh, we are planning to do that. We do get together at a, a restaurant here in town, that, here in, uh, in Scottsdale that is owned by a Portuguese immigrant. Uh, it's, it's an Italian restaurant, but uh, he makes Portuguese food for when we, uh, we all gather. And, it, uh, and it, like I said, the community is just growing slowly and, and becoming uh, more popular. Uh, I'm out on the field. I own a small business here in, uh, in Arizona. So I'm actually at one of the projects that I'm working on. So that's why you may see the background with a construction site, uh, but, uh, but that's, that's what I do. I own a small business and, uh, and I'm just, uh, just out here doing some work. So, and I took some time to, be, to participate on this. I think it's an important uh, topic. Great, thank you. Thank you so much um, for all of you. And I'm located in Philadelphia. So our Portuguese community here is established. We've been around for a long time. Um, I believe our Portuguese club opened in 1935. So we're, we're pretty established. And it's, it's nice to hear from some of you that have moved um, to locations that don't have such a large Portuguese community and really you know, to hear about what, that, what a newer Portuguese community looks like. So I'm interested in your opinions on how, you know, how does a newer Portuguese community evolve? How does it maintain the culture and really what brings everyone together? Well, and I, I'll start again. I mean, this is really, I'll start to like, like I said, we, we, we got together just by, by, by not like I said a minute ago, but not by accident, but because Anna Moda happened to have a concert here in, in Scottsdale and, the, and then uh, all a bunch of Portuguese people got together and, and came to the show. And then we all got together and decided that it was, a, it was time for us to, to uh, together and, and, be, and begin to form a small, a small community and start, talk, start doing start talking about uh, our, our ancestry and our, our, our traditions and, and talk about those things and, and, uh, and enjoy our, our Portuguese food that, that we all love so much. And it and, uh, turned out that, you know, we, uh, we've had, so we've met at this Portuguese, this uh, Italian restaurant that's owned by a Portuguese, but we've also met at uh, different individuals' homes and, and everybody brought a, a traditional Portuguese dish where, where we all enjoy it. So that's, that's how we've been getting together and that's how we've been getting, uh, connecting. And, and I started using Facebook. So I created the Facebook page a few years back. And that also has, has generated a lot of interest in the Portuguese community here. And, and, uh, and, 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 and that's how we all communicate with each other. And that's how we get, get to know new members coming to, to Arizona and coming to the Phoenix area. So in our case, um, we, um, most of the people that came um, around the same time my father did were all dairymen from the island of St. George and they all had known each other at some point. And of course, uh, we all went to the Catholic church. It's the same it's time my father did were all dairymen from, oh, I'm getting feedback now. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, I always find it interesting because my my husband is not Portuguese, and um, when we when um, we have have had friends over the years that have moved into town and they asked us they uh, one of the first questions they ask is uh, where do you guys go to church? We're trying to find you know a church that we can that we feel comfortable in and that we can, you know, become a, a member of and blah, blah. And I'm like, when we were growing up and we moved, um, uh, you know, during my youth, um, there wasn't an option. It's where is the Catholic church? And that's where we went to church and that's where we gathered. And so, um, and likewise here in Idaho, um, all of those Portuguese families all went to the same church. And after church, they started um, going to 
lunch together at different homes in the local restaurants and started talking about what we needed to do to start um, uh, have a, a festa here and because everyone was missing that that cultural piece that um, that they were so familiar with in California. And so some of the uh, families, their daughters had been queens in California in the past and they had uh, the capuch and some had croage and we ordered croage from, um, which at the time was furtados in, in San Jose. And um, that's how, pretty much how our community began here. Well, I can, um, this is Connie Almeida, so I can go next. Um, interesting, it was actually our dentist, um, my good friend, Lydia, uh, who actually manages our Facebook page, and I went to the same dentist, and we had both visited Portugal, so he noticed our tan, which is something that Portuguese have, are fortunate to have. We have that great skin color, um, so. Um, I, I think it was probably against HIPAA, but he actually connected us because we um, had the same last name. And, and truly, it was just based on that. That started, we started small. There were very, very few Portuguese in Texas. Um, and really hard to, to, to find them. Um, and like many of you have talked about, you know, what brings us together and maybe what even keeps us together is... Um, <clears throat> the food and that ability to share. Um, we don't have any Portuguese restaurants. We don't have any, well, we have a semi-Portuguese restaurant, but we don't have any Portuguese stores. We really don't have Portuguese bakeries. So we, any opportunity that we have to get together and really savor, you know, just, I, I think that word, you know, that we have those so and, and to be able to savor that Portuguese food is, um, is really, um, something we look forward to. We don't have clubs. We don't have like a community center. We have never had a festa, um, but we've opened up, you, you know, so usually our get togethers was like in a picnic in a common area. Um, but in the last couple of years, we've actually have had people open up their homes to um, pretty large gatherings, over a hundred people. Um, and I think that's been really fantastic because again, it's, um, you know, if we all, one of my favorite songs is, you know, Amalia Rodrigues, Uma Casa Portuguesa. And, you know, I think that's just something that we all bring that welcoming. Um, so, you know, we, we've um, done a hybrid of things. Um, we've actually have done a wine tasting, which was really fantastic. Um, and it was, uh, we had a vendor from Portugal, Portugal, Portuguese wine. So that was actually very unique. Um, but that's how we've done it. Uh, of course, with COVID, everything is more challenging because we have not been able to, to get together. And uh, I think everybody is longing for that. Um, I was trying to think how many people we have on our Facebook page. Uh, I'm not quite sure because I don't do social media. That's why I have some, one of my friends does that very well and manages that, but it clearly is necessary. Um, but we, our gatherings are usually, you know, 80 to, you know, 150 people. Um, and so uh, that's a little bit about, you know, Houston. We have, we have an honorary council uh, Jose Ibu, who's fantastic and has really been supportive of the community. So he's actually been able to bring in um, some of the consulate services to the community where, you know, we have somebody coming in now, I guess, twice a year, helping with those kinds of things like, you know, cartoons to see the them and, you know, um, power of attorneys and so on. So that's a little bit about Texas. I, I can't speak from experience myself being such a new member of the community, uh, but I can try to analyze all the points that you've brought. And not only, of course, food is a common underlining, but it's what, what comes with food. And I think it's a very Portuguese tradition that we, we, we eat together. It's one of our main uh, sources of, of contact with each other. It's fundamental. Nobody started uh, at, Table etiquette was the thing that was drilled into my mind from two years old. 
but it's that sense. You don't start eating until everyone's seated at the table, until we're all together. Uh, and then, of course, the deliciousness of the food comes with it. Uh, but it's that, that exact, exact community building. The festas are based around the same thing. Uh, ultimately, the idea of the fest is we have the coronations, we have the, the dresses, of course, that's the, the big party aspect of it. But what does it culminate in? Culminates in a long table where everybody comes and eats. Uh, you were talking uh, about, uh, oh, you were talking about the, the different gatherings that you do, that everybody brings a different dish to the table, to meet at the table. Uh, so th there clearly is something about it. Uh, and I, I think it's, especially here in California, I can't speak for the other parts of the United States, but that's a big difference that I've noticed. Uh, my friends and when I visit their, their family homes and even now at college is different, college is much more relaxed in any case, but people eat uh, on their couches watching TV. That was absolutely unthinkable where I am from. You need to sit at a table with a fork on your left and a knife on your right. And the, so, so of course, the, the, these ideas, I'm, I'm trying to, 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 to center them culturally, but to come back to the central idea, Portuguese people like being together. Family is so important to us. Uh, and if we identify that food is one of the things that bring us together, uh, let's go back to Amalia. I, I don't know the exact lines or the exact verses. I can't recite them from memory, but anybody's welcome. There's always a plate at the table for them. Uh, so if we're talking about these new communities, it's definitely through inviting them for food. We, we get them, we, we, we'll touch their hearts through their stomachs. Absolutely, I think that is really what attracts people, you know, to, to events is, is food. Um, and our food is so is so good and so, so broad and really can satisfy so many different tastes. And I think that's one of the, re the ways that to bring people to events um, and to really keep our culture is through, through food. And, and to jump on to a point that Connie made um, and, and also Gonzalo made about sharing food, sharing food is a means of sharing traditions. And as a Portuguese American community, and particularly in Hawaii, the Portuguese Americans came from all, all different parts of Portugal, uh, continental Portugal, the Azores, like Lucy, uh, my great grandfather's from Madeira. And here in Hawaii, you know, if, if you were uh, a good example is um, on Kauai, the island of Kauai, they, they haven't had an active Portuguese community in years. Uh, there was a hurricane in the early 1990s, and it was very difficult for groups to be able to meet. A few years ago, um, one of the uh, elders in the community said, well, we got to get back together. You know, everyone's getting older. We got to pass on these traditions. And so food making became a common thing, not only in their family, but their entire extended family and their neighbors. So they came together um, to make bread. And this has become a tradition that has grown. Um, and they do it every few months in somebody's yard. They still have a forno made out of stones. Um, but it's interesting to see how every family's method of making bread is a little bit different. And there's a learning experience that goes along with that. And so here in Hawaii, where most, where half the people are from Madeira and half are from the Azores, um, there's sort of a difference between, in Madeira is the bolo de caco and in uh, the Azores it's masa subada and it's, it's sweet and fluffy and delicious. And that's uh, much more common. Um, and so that's been like a, an interesting learning experience. The challenge has been, you know, if everybody calls just their family, how do you grow that? And how do you spread the word? And so we're trying to figure that out here. Um, how do you spread the word and let people know? And uh, when we have festas, it goes out just with the newsletter to everyone who's a member of the organization, but that's not enough, right? And so, you know, we're looking at ways we can um, get some commercial mailing lists and everyone who's sort of a Portuguese last name, can we mail them a postcard? They may not be a part of a, an existing group, but they may have a passion or interest in culture um newspaper ads in the sort of general newspaper circulation uh you know papers on each island in our case or each county and some other states um just to spread the word more effectively uh because i think there's people who want to get involved but they maybe don't know so we have to bring it to them and what do you think is the best way to bring it to them i know like we mentioned the facebook group that arizona has what has worked in your communities what has brought people together and how how have you gotten the word out one really cool thing that we've been able to do is um, we engage with the local media. So we had an author from Portugal uh, come to Hawaii. Her, she's a surfer. She writes children's books about getting out and being active. So of course she came to Hawaii and um, we had her on the morning news and the morning news programs, 
they're, they're often like starved for content, right? Who wants to get up at 6.30 in the morning and do a morning news interview? But there's a lot of people watching as they make breakfast or get ready to go to work. And um, it's actually fairly easy to get on the morning news if you have an interesting story to tell. Um, so that's been one. Um, and again, you know, the newspapers, every newspaper probably has an art and culture reporter. They also are always looking for something to talk about. Um, so it's building those relationships and, uh, you know, figuring out what their email and phone number is for those reporters. And that's a great way of getting the word out. I was going to follow up on that. You know, um, sometimes we tend to be uh, a little exclusive, you know, um, so, you know, we're from even with even among the Portuguese, you know, what part of the country you're from. I'm from the Serra de Estrela. But, you know, we, we tend to be a little exclusive. And I, I think what we're challenged with now is, um, you know, we're, we're, we're small in numbers. Um, and so it, it's, it's just what you, what you were just talking about. How, do, how are we more inclusive? Because we want this richness of our heritage to influence more people. And, um, you know, so it's like, if people have an interest in Portuguese culture and Portuguese language, they don't necessarily need to be from Portugal you know, or from a certain part of Portugal. Um, but I think that is the challenge. How do we share, you know, that heritage and that richness that we have with the world? Um, you know, I was in Portugal in the summer and which was wonderful, you know, just the things that you appreciate in terms of the light and the food and the air and the people. Um, but I was reminded of, you know, we had to go beyond our comfort zone and become navigators and explore the world. You know, that's what we did. We developed something really good, you know, these boats and explored and conquered the world. And then we lost it. But, uh, um, but I think, but I think, you know, it's kind of like that. How do we maintain those connections? How do we explore? How do we go beyond our comfort zones? So I, I'd like to share a little bit. Um, at our festers, we go out and get donations from the community and uh, local banks, the local feed companies, the local hay companies, uh, dairy supply. Uh, and a lot of these are not Portuguese owned businesses, but over the years, um, and it was, it was hard at first to uh, get buy-in from these people and then they figured out that the people that uh, were going to them were in, in fact some of their customers. And so uh, the, at, some, at one point they were more than happy to make that contribution and that has uh, continued over the years. And so many of our um, donors are not, uh, our donors for the auction are not Portuguese at all. Um, and, uh, so there's that. Uh, we also, someone said they don't do Facebook. I do. Um, and we, um, we travel to the Azor Island um, every year. We go to Chiseida and then from Chiseida we either go to the mainland or we go to Madeira or we go to one of the other islands. But every year we do that. And I post that on, on my Facebook page and um, I have, you know, I know quite a few people and I get comments from some of my American friends. Oh my gosh, your pictures are amazing. Uh, where did you go? That is so beautiful, blah, blah. And there's an opportunity to talk about our heritage and, and our homeland and our culture. And so, and I get that quite a bit from, from my friends. Um, yeah. I recently went to a fundraiser for our governor and he had seen my Facebook page and had seen that we were in the Azores this summer. And he was asking about how, what the, what it was like to have been born in the Azores and what my family struggles had been and what got us here. So through those, uh, that kind of communication and through, through those avenues and networking is, um, has really been helpful because I am very proud of, of my um, Portugueseness, if you will. 
<laughs> so, um, yeah. As we open it broader to, to the wider community, not only to the Portuguese community that might not be tapped into itself, uh, as to anybody that has an interest in, in the Portuguese community, as Connie was mentioning, uh, I think it could be of our interest to tap into the things that we've already made mainstream that might, some people might associate them with Portugal, maybe not, or if they do, it's just, oh yeah, it's Portuguese. Uh, and as you were speaking, Tyler, it reminded me of the Malasavich. Uh, when, when I visited Hawaii and I, I touched down and got in an Uber to get to the hotel, where are you from? Oh, originally from Portugal. Oh, so you know about Malasavich. First thing I heard, it was the first words coming out of my, of my Uber. And I didn't know what they were. We called them Bolas in, 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 in the North. But I went and visited and everybody knew, yes, this is a Portuguese treat. It's a Portuguese sweet. It's this is what we did. It's Portuguese, Portuguese, Portuguese. But now we're missing that extra step. How do we go from, okay, yes, that's a Portuguese thing to what else is Portuguese? How, how can I know more? So if we tap into this, these things that are already mainstream, there is, I'm picking this, this one example because it just came to mind. But if we, if we set up shop at the front of the, I forget the name, the famous Molasada, the famous Molasada shop. And that day we are also offering uh, pastel de nata. And we offer a pastel de nata to someone who tries the Molasada. Now they know two things that are Portuguese. They're both delicious. So they're doubly interested in whatever's further. Uh, they, they're now tapping in into the actual culture, not into the trinkets of the culture. It's not just seeing the flag, it's understanding what the red the green and the and the sphere means in the middle uh, that uh, the trying to make that connection a step beyond i've uh, you know so one of the things that i've done in the past so when i go to portugal the last few times i've been to portugal i've taken uh, uh first time first time i took uh i think it was 16 people with me and we went on the cruise of the river Douro, uh and it was just amazing people just absolutely fell in love with portugal and and then i took them up to my uh to my uh to my village in uh, in Ispazin. and uh, that even that blew them even more away because they they got to experience my cousin's farms, they got to eat at my cousin's uh, house, and they got to eat the food that came right out of the his his farm right there, right outside his backyard, and people just love that kind of stuff. And uh, so uh, so I've done that uh, quite a bit, uh, quite a, quite a, quite a few times now, and uh, and every time uh, I, I people become more familiar with Portugal, and they 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 continue to to uh, ask more questions and continue to ask me when when are we going back and and we keep telling them one of these days i'm oh, we'll make it happen again we haven't done it because of COVID the last couple of years but but uh, probably this coming summer we'll do that the other thing that we've done here is uh, is i mentioned animoda so animoda was the start of our community here in, in, uh, in arizona so we continue that so coming up here in march we're going to have uh, uh, marta Pereira da costa who's gonna who's a portuguese uh, portuguese guitarist She's actually coming to Wickenburg to the Performing Arts Center here in Wickenburg, and she's going to do a concert here. So we're we take, we're making that opportunity to, uh, to to gather the Portuguese community and also to introduce Portugal to uh, a, a whole new group of people that have never that they probably don't even know about the Portuguese guitar, probably don't even know about Fado, and and uh, and we'll we'll teach them about that. So it gives us kind of a double a double a double win. Honey, you look like you're going to say something. Yeah, I, I did. It, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, um, several years ago, more on a professional level, because it, you know, I was actually able to uh, be part of a like a judiciary conference that we hosted in Portugal, and that was probably one of the most rewarding um, things that I've done in a long time work-wise, but it was this ability to kind of share, well, not to kind of, to share some of the things we've learned here, but also learn from Portugal, you know? So, and again, you know, I work in the mental health and justice field and, um, and it, it's interesting because sometimes we, there's certain things that, you know, we maybe do well, but there's also so many policies in Portugal um, and maybe because they're a smaller country, more innovative, willing to think outside the box, but, you know, really amazing things that they've done um, that have had better outcomes than what we've done here in the United States. So I, I don't, you know, I think that's kind of a sidebar to this conversation. Um, 
but there's a lot of talent among the Portuguese community. And, you know, and I was thinking about, yeah, we have this food, we have this family, we have this connection, we have faith, we have music, um, but we also have an amazing work ethic. And, you know, I think, yeah, I mean, growing up, um, not only the commitment to family and connections, but the work ethic. And uh, I think that's something we can be very proud of. And um, maybe how do we nurture that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Connie. And uh, as I've, I've started to dive in deeper to the studies of the Portuguese here in California, uh, as I'm preparing to write a thesis on that, and that's always, in all the papers that I've read, the work ethic of the Portuguese is always underlined. Uh, they came here, especially we're talking about the studies mainly done in the first half of the, of the past century, by the first half of the 20th century. All those immigrants that came virtually with nothing, the clothes on their back, and the Portuguese language, not even the English one. And the fact that they established and sought to build for themselves the future they wanted. Um, I think if, if there is a community that has lived, uh, whatever it means, but the American dream, I think it was the Portuguese that set sail and okay, we're gonna do this and they did. Uh, so that is a big value. And I think it's a point of connection between um, the Portuguese American community and Portugal itself and how we can nurture these communities for future generations, thirds, fourths, and fifths uh, that are for all intents and purposes now solely and purely American. I don't, some of them don't have any contact with Portugal anymore. Talking about that work ethic, that, 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 that idea of that makes America so proud of itself, that works for its objectives, that fights and fights and fights until it gets it. We do the same, more, we've done it. And we, we have proof for all, all of you here. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm the product of it, but all of you are the proof of it. Uh, so I think that showing that, I, I use the words market uh, very loosely here, but marketing that will garnish interest in, in our community. And we'll, I think we'll present ourselves with the value that we deserve. Right. And Gonzalo, I think you brought a great point about future generations. You know, I'm, I'm lucky enough that I'm first generation here, so I still have very strong ties to Portugal. I grew up going there every single summer. I'm completely fluent in Portuguese. Um, and I have a two year old daughter and I know she's not going to be as fluent as I am, no matter how much Portuguese I speak to her. And, you know, and my grandkids will be even less. So, you know, how what can we do to really hold our culture here, especially since there's a lot less immigration um, from Portugal here to the United States. So it's going to be, you know, the, the generations that will always have the ties back to Portugal through family, but not the strong connections that a lot of us still have. So how can we get those people involved that are, you know, maybe third, fourth, fifth generations that have passed, they know what a pastel nata is because it was passed down by family or, you know, carne por calanchana because they're, it's the one dish that the grandmother always taught and the mom made. But really, you know, as, as, people, as more generations, you know, the further along it's gonna get. So, I'm, you know, people always wanna go back to their roots. You know, they wanna know what their history. And I think things like Ancestry DNA and um, 23andMe show you, you know, where, where you're from and people will be curious. So, you know, I think Facebook and having people being able to find Portuguese communities is really, is really important. And then how can we include um, the people that may not speak fluent Portuguese, may not really know that much, but wanna learn. Uh, I want to pick up a sense, uh, two, two citations. One of them, Fernando Pessoa. A minha patria é a língua portuguesa. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a beautiful sentence. I love Pessoa. He's one of my idols. But I think I like Mia Couto's version of it a little bit better. And Mia Couto says, A minha patria é a minha língua portuguesa. So it's my own Portuguese language. Mia Couto is a, 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 an author from Mozambique. And I think that's what we need to, to look at it here in the United States. I found a paper, uh, along the studies that I've been making, I found a paper about a symposium that was made here in California a while back. And there's a, a big chapter, a considerable chapter about all the Eng Anglicisms, I think I'm using that word right, uh, that the Portuguese have made here and how the words have transformed and translated um, to be Portuguese words almost sounding, you read it and it looks like a Portuguese word. It doesn't exist in a Portuguese dictionary because it's pronouncing an English word the Portuguese way. I've yeah. also heard the stories that in, in, I believe it's in Newark, that some of the English verbs are conjugated with Portuguese grammar. So to eat, it would be eat that, and you add the AR and then you just conjugate it. And 
allowing for that to happen, not gatekeeping the language because it, it, it hasn't been gatekept. If, if we were trying to, we lost. Uh, because Brazil, Brazilian Portuguese is spoken by 200 million people and it's not the same language and thankfully it isn't because that's the, the diversity that, that, that is, makes the Portuguese language so beautiful. Uh, so allowing for that to happen here in the United States is what needs to, to happen. And, and I'm glad you brought up Brazil because this is a uh, sort of a controversial topic here in Hawaii among our Portuguese community is when we have a festa, do we invite members of the Brazilian community to participate and set up, set up booths and have uh, a capoeira performance or jujitsu or whatever um, on stage. And, you know, there have been some people who are very resistant to it, but uh, to, to a point that we were talking about earlier is how do we invite people in and not gatekeep, but also, um, you know, for the general public, they probably, uh, you know, for better or worse, know more about Brazil and Brazilian culture and listen to, you know, Carlos Jumbim and everyone else. Um, a lot more than you know they might know about Portugal, and and that's a great entry point to learning more about the culture. And so, um, in in talking about future festas, um, I've been very adamant saying we should invite them. And in Hawaii, we've got a lot of Brazilian surfers and you know other folks who end up here. Let's bring them in and help to enrich our local community rather than um, gatekeeping. I, I agree, I... Tyler. Oh, oh, sorry, Gonzalo. No, I, I agree, Tyler. We we invite so. Here in Arizona, we have a, a large Brazilian community as well. And, and actually, they, for a while, they had a couple of Brazilian restaurants here as well. And so when we get together, we do invite Portuguese. And in and, and a former my former job that I had, I actually ended up meeting quite a few Brazilians and ended up learning that they were of uh, Portuguese ancestry. So so now I invite them also to our gatherings because they they bring a lot of uh, they bring a lot of they bring some of the traditions that they that they learn from their grandparents and their parents uh, back in Brazil. and. And and we all we all share those. So it's it's great. I, I know I, we should we should include them always. I was I was going to add. So um, it, it's interesting being an immigrant back in the s <clears throat> '60s. Um, you know, we want to assimilate. You know, you want to learn the language. You don't want to be different. You know, because you're already you already feel different. You know, you're poor. You don't have. You're uneducated. You know, so you struggle. You struggle to, and you work really hard to assimilate. And it's interesting, I'm a grandmother now, and I am much more, I'm a little older too, but I'm much more confident and engaged with my grandchildren on speaking the Portuguese language than I actually was with my children. Um, different parts of my life, you know, um, you know um, whatever was going on, but with the children, with my grandchildren, it's fun. Portuguese sounds great. It sounds fun. It's Portuguese music. And of course, we tie it into arroz dos, you know, so it's like we tie it into cooking again. And um, I think that was maybe the question is how do we keep some of this going? Um, I think grandparents can definitely have a really you know, um, important role in this, you know, we had some ideas about, you know, having like a cooking competition, even virtually, you know, grandmothers with granddaughters, you know, who can make the best rice pudding or the best piazzas or something like that. Um, but it, again, I think grandparents um, can play a really important role in this and in, um, in maintaining it. So, and it's, and it's interesting because, um, you know, I can definitely see the difference of when I was growing up, everything was very serious, very serious, you know, no time for playing. And now, um, again, when I'm older, it's like Portuguese is fun and uh, which makes it much more interesting for them. That's very true. Uh, we grew up, I grew up on, on a dairy and it was all about work. Um, my my husband is very athletic. He skis, he uh, surfs, he, um, he golfs, he does everything athletic. Um, I'm not so much. And I told him, um, but I can buck hay better than you because that's, <laughs> that's what, what we did. Um, our, our farm was dairy, op was uh, owner, operated was family operated and so all of our energy growing up 
was dedicated to our livelihood and, and our farm. And that's how we sustained. And, and that was what my dad instilled in us. And so I didn't have a lot of time for the extracurricular stuff. And so, and I, and I see um, how, you know, my husband was raised and how um, children are, are raised today. And it's all about um, exposing them to sports and, and to extracurricular activities and this and that and the other. And, and um, something um, has, in, in a way, um, it's, it's become very, it, it, it makes my heart happy to see that, that we are not so serious and so focused on um, survival, I guess. But it also makes me sad because that's, that was a part of, that was part of what united us and what joined us as, as a family. And um, most of the other families that we were friends with in my youth, um, had the same, the same life uh, experiences that I did, and um, as as an, a Portuguese adult, we're all so different now. We've gone in so many different directions, and that's not to say it's good or bad. It's just different. We've all evolved, and so for whatever that's worth, I wanted to share that. Lucy, to me, that is amazing. I see that only in a positive light. Uh, and I understand, of course, there, there, there are feelings of tradition and everything. And I, I hold on to those as well, being Portuguese and being from back home. Uh, but I am also uh, a, a utopianist. Uh, I, it's my great fault. Uh, I talked about Fernando Pessoa, definitely one of my idols. Also, Agustin da Silva, Padre Antonio Vieira. These three names all, always bouncing around in my mind. Uh, and coming back to uh, Tyler and Rui, what you were talking about of the bringing in Brazilian uh, communities into the Portuguese. I, the question for me is what is Portugal? Uh, because we, we use the name for the state that is defined by the borders of a rectangle and some islands sprinkled across the Atlantic. Fair enough, that is one valid definition for the noun Portugal. But I like another one better. I like another definition better because to me, Portugal cannot be just a territory. It needs to be a, a state of mind. Uh, the Portuguese were always, have been, and will continue to be so diverse, spread out across the world. We are all examples of that. So uh, with so, so many different life paths, as you were mentioning, Lucy, the fact that we grow, uh, not only do we grow apart from the mainland, but we grow apart from ourselves and each other. It's just the, na the, nat the nature of that growth. Our future generations won't speak as much Portuguese as we do. Um, I have a friend who's second or third generation. His last name is Carvalho. Well, I say it's Carvalho. He says it's Carvalho. So it all reads up. H has already dropped. And there's nothing we can do about that. It's, it's the nature of, of things, that I believe. I, what we can do about it is accept it. Look at it in the positive that I truly believe that there is. And Portugal becoming then this state of mind where it includes the people from Portugal, its traditions, its flag, its hymn, whatever you want to associate with it. But it also includes the people of Brazil, the people of Goa, the people of Malacca, the people of Macau, uh, the people of California, Massachusetts, uh, Idaho. Uh, all of those need to be part of Portugal. And if we're talking about uh, new perspectives on communities and perspectives on new communities, wherever we want to put the new in there, uh, it needs to be wide, wide open. Uh, so I believe there is great value in bringing in um, the Brazil, talking about the Brazilian in specific, I believe there's great value in bringing in those people and their traditions into our celebrations and pivoting. We're not celebrating the culture from within the tiny rectangle at the edge of Europe that conquered everything else. Uh, we are celebrating the world past the, the conquering and subsequent loss. We are celebrating the world that we live in today, which is the spread out world. Uh, and tapping into that one, I think, is will be our great success. Gonzalo, I think I think I'm a traditionalist. You know, I I I listen to uh, I listen to the Portuguese news uh, quite often, and 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 I read the newspaper, and and like really something that drives me really nuts is 
the the mixture of, of English and the Portuguese language that drives me absolutely nuts because <laughs> it just uh, I, I I grew up uh, I grew up uh, uh, speaking proper Portuguese and 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 when I go back to Portugal and I listen to someone saying you know adding a port an English word to the to 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 talk about something like a restaurant or a, or not a restaurant but but or naming restaurants in English and they in and calling different things uh, using the English words to describe something that drives me absolutely wild because I, 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 I like I said I'm a traditionalist I like I like the Portuguese language and I think it should stay pure uh, and 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 the Brazilians have I love the Brazilian language it's a beautiful language it's beautiful the way they speak it the way they the way they 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 pronounce the words and so on it's it's beautiful but I I I would love for us to I'd love for Portuguese Portugal and Portuguese to maintain that traditional language and then not mix it with anything else in there and just keep, keep that tradition. But it's not just us here in the States that are, that do that. They do that in the Azores, especially. I, uh, I've been to Lisbon um, a couple of times and, and to Madeira and, but just in passing, but I spend quite a bit of time in, in Seda and in the Azores uh, in general. And I hear that, uh, they they are borrowing American words. Uh, today, for example, they're having a, a torada corda in uh, in Seda today, the first one that they've had since this whole COVID thing started. And I was reading some of the comments on it, and one lady said, oh, I would love to be there, but I'm waiting for my husband to get off work. And um, a fazer babysitter, a minha neta. <laughs> babysitter is what she called it. And this is a Portuguese woman, you know, living in the Azores. And that's the, that's the word she used. So we're not doing it here exclusively. They, they are using American words and, um, you know, using them uh, to describe what we would call a babysitter, um, you know, babysitter, so. Gonzalo, your hands up. Uy, allow me a, a friendly challenge, if I may. Uh, <laughs> uh, Absolutely, because, Gonzalo, I love a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I, I, I think that there is great value in maintaining the Portuguese language. It's one of the richest in the whole world. We have terms for anything and everything. Uh, there's not a there's not anything that we don't have a word for, um, and that's great. And I and I will continue to study it, uh, and so will you because you have an interest in it, and so will everybody that has an interest in it. Uh, so it will then be maintained, uh, one way or another, by a faction uh, of our broader community. I also believe that there is important then to allow the other factions to explore their different versions uh, of the Portuguese because it is it's. Um, I, I found it funny, and this is something that I realized uh, the other day when I was studying for another conference. Um, I, I've always heard, my grandfather always told me that uh, with great pride, and I always had great pride in it and still do, that the Japanese language has two, at least 200 terms that directly derive from the Portuguese. See, Portuguese, we go and we establish our language. Ah, those are the Japanese speak it the way that we do. I've never heard mention at the also hundreds of words that the Portuguese have adapted from Japan. Uh, because that, that is harder for us to speak about exactly because of that purism. We, we, we like it. Uh, and, and of course we do. We, 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 um, it, everybody likes to feel good and feel like they've done uh, good and they, their ideas have, have, have surfaced. But I think that we need to always take both. And if we should invest into continuing and maintaining this rich language that, is, uh, that comes from Portugal, but also study how it can evolve in different ways and keeping all of those. I don't, I'm not saying that we should prioritize uh, speaking English with Portuguese conjugation of verbs. I'm saying that it will happen. So we should celebrate it as well uh, and not heighten it above the natural Portuguese language. Not say, see, see, this is the path for evolution. No, I think it's two paths. Um, so I, uh, the, the challenge being, uh, let's, I just don't think we should prioritize one over the other. Challenge accepted. <laughs> now, you know, one of the things that I, I one of the things that I, so I, I, I keep up on, I keep, I keep up with the other communities around the, around the country and spe specifically more 
so in Massachusetts and in New England because that's where I that's where I grew up. But I'm always amazed the amount of work that the Portuguese community does in, in those areas to maintain the Portuguese traditions, and they do it because there's there's a mass of people that they can attract to be able to put together festas and and, and do gatherings all the time. For us here, for, for us here in the West, that are specifically the smaller communities like in Houston, like Connie has, and myself here in, in Arizona, we are very small communities. For us to be able to get that mass of people to be able to get together and, and, and do festas and continue the Portuguese traditions becomes a bit more difficult. And 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 to create this, so in, back east, uh, you know, there's Portuguese schools where 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 I, you know, when I moved to the states, I came here when I was 13 years old. So for the for until I graduated from high school, I went to I went to American school. And I went to Portuguese school where I learned how to continue to learn to speak Portuguese and, and, and learn all the all the verbs and all that kind of stuff in, in Portuguese. Uh, but but out here, for us, it's really difficult because we don't have that mass to be able to, to make that happen. So it becomes very challenging. So, you know, and I, so Anna, you asked how, how do we maintain that? That's how we need, to, we need to work on that. We need to figure out how we do that. And it's going to have to be a kind of a form of mixing of a hybrid of, uh, of maybe partnering with the schools in back east where we, where they do some sort of an online type school, where they when they do online when they do in person schools for Portuguese, our kids here in, in, in Arizona or in or in Texas or in or in Idaho can also participate in the digital uh, format. Right, I think having you know a lot of what ha has happened in the last year and a half um, due to COVID has really opened up more opportunities um, for for people. You know, we can even have a teacher in Lisbon teaching children across the United States, you know, the, the Portuguese that's spoken in Portugal and, you know, the correct, the correct Portuguese with a little mix of English. No, that, that, that would be great. No, that, that'd be, that, that's, that's a great idea. Absolutely. Connie, your hand is up. Do you, do you want to add anything? I just wanted to add quickly and then I have to get off also, but, um, and I do think that that's like where organizations like Falcus can, can help you know, um, pull this together because obviously if somebody's doing something in the Northeast in a community and, you know, in California and um, New Jersey where there, is, where there are those really strong communities. Um, but, you know, you maybe have 20 people out in Kentucky or something that are Portuguese and want to be able to participate. So I think we really need to look at that virtual platform of how we can stay connected and, um, and even engage the younger generation. Um, so I, I think that's great. The only other point that I have is, you know, I, I'm a researcher and pretty data driven. And, you know, I start thinking, well, have we ever done a survey? You know, I mean, have we ever asked like, you know, what, like in, in really looking at it, different generations, what, what do people know about Portugal? What do they want to know? I mean, I keep on learning more about my history than I ever knew. And I should have known that. I should have known about the Arabic influence on Portugal, which I never knew. But anyway, I just wanted to bring up those couple points and I, I do need to get off also. Absolutely. And just um, to wrap everything up, you know, exactly what you mentioned about Connie, using the social media and everything to keep us connected. Halkus is actually gonna be launching a new platform, um, possibly early November, where it's gonna be an app and everything's gonna be on there. So connections to scholarships, businesses, anything Portuguese related, um, the mobile app is gonna have access to everything. And I think that's really important to really keep everybody together, no matter where you are. So, um, if anyone needs more information about Palkus, feel free to contact me. You can go to palkus.org, get information there, become a member, and you'll have access to a, a bunch of resources that we have. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Thank you for the viewers for watching. And again, we're, we're here to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thank Bye, you, Anna, for putting this together. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.